we're actually going to conclude our series in Rhythms Reloaded. We are um, at the end of it next week. We have a special treat for you next week. I'm going to leave that about all I'm going to say because it's going to be fun next week. So come back uh, and, uh, and then the following week we will start, uh, actually in a couple weeks, we'll start our series through the summer in Daniel. And so that'll be a walk through the book of Daniel this summer. So uh, we'd love for you to stick around for that. First Timothy chapter 4 is where we are. Uh, we're going to read a few verses and then dive right into it. First Timothy chapter 4, starting in verse 6. If you put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, being trained in the words of faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed. Have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. For to this end we toil and strive, because we have our hope set on the living God, who is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe. Command and teach these things. Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Until I come, devote yourselves to the public reading of the Scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. Do not neglect the gift you have, which was given you by prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. Practice these things. Immerse yourself in them so that all may see your progress. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by so doing, you will save both yourself and your hearers. This is the word of the Lord. So today we're going to continue into uh, another Rhythm. It's actually not really a rhythm. It's just an encouragement to continue in the rhythms that we've already talked about, in the spiritual disciplines that we've talked about. We talked about some at the beginning of the year, and we've talked about some the last few weeks. But I want to I want to jump in by uh, by just introducing an, another passage of scripture to help us. Uh, you don't have to turn there. I'll just put it on the screen real quick. But Paul says, again, in Corinthians, he says, Do not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize. So run that you may obtain it. We can think about disciplines. We can think about spiritual rhythms in our life. But if we don't live in such a way to obtain it, to do those things, we're just wasting our time. He says, every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a, a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I, I do not uh, box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. To discipline yourself is to battle. It, it is to battle. It's, a, it's like a, a competition to see who will win out. You say, well, what's the battle between? It's what you should do and what you shouldn't do and what you feel like you, should, you want to do and what you feel like what you don't want to do. What you feel and what you should are two different things. Amen? Sometimes we feel like we want to do something, but we know we ought not to. We have heard enough in life to know that some of the things that we want in life will take a lot of discipline to accomplish. Pro athletes don't wake up one day 
and, 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 and can play at the level that they do. No, there's, there's a lot of hard work. There's a lot of perseverance that goes into them making it to this elite position. Some of you have heard of Steph Curry. Steph Curry plays for the Golden State Warriors. And he's been, it's been said that he is one of the greatest three-point shooters in all of NBA. You think, well, how did he get such a level of accuracy? Tony Robbins, doing an article about him, said this. It's simple. He makes 500 shots every day. Tallied up, that's, th- that's 3,500 shots per week, 168,000 per year, and 2.52 million shots over the 15 years Steph's been in the NBA. If you want to be the best, you have to persevere. I've heard him, I've heard Steph talk about it. Some days when he's shooting the 500, notice he makes 500. That, that, that means that he probably shoots more than 500 if he's anything like me. He's going to shoot more than 500 to make 500. <laughs> Amen? So he's going to miss a few, but you persevere. You keep fighting. You keep fighting because you know that, that in the game, you're, you're not going to always have that perfect shot. So you've got to be able to shoot it from every spot on the court, and that's what he does in practice. The same could be said for our spiritual life. If we want to be stronger and healthier in our walk with Jesus, we must battle our fleshly desires and our sinful temptations and discipline ourselves and our bodies so that we can persevere to accomplish what the Lord has called us to or what he will call us to. We don't know what tomorrow holds, but discipline takes effort. Remember the goal. What is the goal? What is the purpose of discipline? We said that discipline without direction is what? Drudgery. Discipline without direction is drudgery. If Steph had, if, if he thought he would never play in an NBA game, why in the world is he making 500 shots a day? That would be drudgery. What are you wasting your time for, Steph? You're not even in the NBA, and you're past your prime. What are you doing? Discipline without direction is drudgery. And what is our direction in spiritual disciplines, in the spiritual rhythms of life? We want to be godly. Godliness is our purpose. Godliness, though, takes perseverance. A disciplined life takes perseverance. This is what I want to talk a little bit about this morning as we conclude this series. And I want us to think about persevering. Because I know life. And I know that some of the disciplines that we even talked about at the beginning of the year... You guys have already forgot about them. I, I, I know that, 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 that uh, your, your New Year's resolutions that you, you were just all gung-ho about and you were January 1, here we go. It's almost summer and you thought, man, what was my New Year's? I don't even remember what it was. If we're going to be disciplined, we have to be what? We have to persevere through the cold and the rain, and the heat, and the tiredness, and and the difficulties, and the persecution, and the sorrows, and all of those things, we have to persevere through that to accomplish what God has set out for us. James chapter 1 says, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he stood the test, he will receive a crown of life, which God has promised. Later on in James, he says, In chapter 5, he says, Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You've heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and mercy. 
Matthew chapter 10 says this, And you will be hated for all for my name's sake, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. We are called to persevere even though we have the promise of salvation. We are called to what? Persevere, endure to the end. Discipline yourself. Martin Lord Jones says, we discipline our, our lives. We must be disciplined our, in our lives, but we must do so all the year round and not merely at stated periods. I must discipline myself at all times. It takes perseverance, amen? To continue to do the things that you know that you're supposed to do or that you ought to do. It takes perseverance to push away those feelings, those, those sinful desires, those fleshly desires. It takes perseverance to discipline your body in those weak moments so that on the other side you can say, I am not giving in. I am pursuing holiness, not just my feelings. The call here is to remain, to be steadfast, to persevere through all things for the glory of God. We have heard all the rhythms or disciplines that we need to consider and even implement it in our life so we can be more godly in our life. But, the, but just like those New Year's resolutions, it will take perseverance to see it through. You say, well, Lee, what is perseverance? Well, Wesler says, it is continued effort to do or achieve something despite difficulties, failure, or opposition. Every bit, every day, you are going to be faced with opposition to not live the godly life. To not discipline yourself in, in your faith, in the reading and the studying and the implementing of these things in your life. The world is pushing back on you as hard as it can. There is Every day you're going to receive opposition. And so we must persevere. Ephesians chapter 6, Paul says, Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, so that you may be able to withstand the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. That's what we want, right? To stand firm through these days. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes on your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace, in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with, with which you can in, extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints and also for me, that words may be given to me in, in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel. How is it that Paul says that we are going to persevere? We have to put on this armor. Amen? Now, this is, a, this is not a, a literal, literal army, I mean armor. This is a spiritual armor that every day when your feet hit the floor, you should say, Lord... May you, would, would, would you put on this breastplate of righteousness? Would you help me put this, this shield of faith, this helmet of truth, this sword of the Spirit? Would you let my feet be the feet that are shod with the shoes that take the good news? Would you protect me from the fiery darts? Lord, I know what's coming today. But there's a lot of things that I don't know. Would you help me to persevere through all those things? Paul uses this word perseverance in this passage and it comes from two Greek words that mean forward to and to be strong or to be steadfast. So persistency is to move forward while enduring much along the way but striving to be strong and steadfast. This is what God has called us to, to move forward in him to take our next step. 
It may be hard, but let me encourage you to persevere. Paul gives his protege, Timothy, some advice in his letter in Timothy that we just read. It was, it was like he was saying to Timothy, persevere, endure, be steadfast, not just for you and your walk with Christ, but for the body of Christ. Now, I want to look back at this passage, and I want to run through some words real quickly as we look through. I want you to open up your Bible. I want you to look at it, and I want you to see some of these words. As we go through this passage, I'm just going to pull out a lot of single words that as I was going through it, I was like, these are perseverance words. These are words used to encourage Timothy to be steadfast, to endure, to persevere in this calling that God has given him. And so first we look at, at, um, at verse 6. And he says, be trained or being trained. This is one of our, our leadership values at our church to, to be trained. But we, we must be trained and be being trained so that we may endure. It's not that in the Christian walk, you are trained and then you're set off to go train others. You need to be, be, being trained. Does that make sense? Just because you went through our Believe class, you're like, ready to go. No, you need to take another Believe class, but teach that Believe class to your friends and family and take another one and keep, and keep reading and keep diving and keep searching and keep being trained trained. You say, well, how is that a perseverance? That, that's, you missed it. Being trained helps you what? Persevere. Because along the way, you're learning how and, and, and to what extent that you can discipline your body, discipline your mind, so that you can accomplish what God has set out for you. Some of us feel like we have arrived spiritually. Let me just encourage you. You have not arrived spiritually. Well, Lee, you just don't know all the Bible studies that I've done. Well, maybe I don't, but you haven't arrived yet. I'll tell you when you have arrived. When you're glorified, standing before the Father, and he says, now you're complete. So until then... Be trained. My grandmother was married to a Baptist pastor. While he was in seminary, she thought, well, he's in seminary. Why don't I get trained? So she went into seminary. She's got like 90-something hours in seminary education. Never did anything with it other than teach Sunday school. And she taught Sunday school into her 90s. And I would go eat with my, my grandmother, and she would tell me what she is learning through the scriptures. I had the opportunity, uh, when I was in between jobs, uh, I would, I, I would I'd, I'd go eat, I'd go um, visit my grandmother at her church. And she sat three rows back, right in the middle. And so I showed up. She comes out of Sunday school, sees me there. I got to sit with her and eat a steak when Grant when. When, when grandchild shows up, mom, mamaw's going to buy you a steak. So we ate a steak. And she was telling me all that God was doing in her life. In her 90s. And I would even say, until the last day that she took her breath, she was reading God's word. She was seeking the Lord. I don't, I don't know how old you are, but you're not as old as my mamaw. My mom all died when she was 100 years old. And up until that point, she was reading and being trained. The second thing we see in this passage is that Paul points out to Timothy, he says, train yourself for godliness. Again, Paul draws Timothy to this self-effort of disciplining yourself or training yourself to be more and more like Christ, to be godly. 
Notice what he says to be trained in. He says, being trained in the words of the faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed, not in silly myths. Do not get sidetracked with silly myths of this day. Stay focused on the good doctrine of God's word. Be trained. But look at what he says in verse 9. He says that we are to have full acceptance of these things. Of what things? Of the good doctrine of God's word. He says in verse 9, The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. Full acceptance of, of God's word, of his teaching of the belief in salvation through faith in Jesus. Full acceptance of the doctrines of the scripture. And when we have this, this full acceptance, and let me say it, let me say it in, in, in the slang of today, full send. Like you're all in to the doctrines of the scriptures. There, there's not like I got one toe in and, and one toe out. No, you full sin. You're all in full acceptance to God. That is how you can persevere. Because if you've got half of you hanging out over here and some of you over here, when it gets difficult, guess what you're going to do? Uh, I'll go the easy route. I'm already half over there anyway. But if you're all in to his word and to, and to the pursuit of godliness, well, it will help you to persevere. The next thing we, I want you to see, and I'm going quickly through this passage, but the next thing I want you to see is that he says in verse 20 that we toil and strive. To persevere is not going to be fun. This is where we begin to see the struggle that is involved in perseverance. It will take the toil and the strife of all of us to fight the battle of the flesh. You say, well, what what does it mean to toil and strife? Toil in the Greek here is to labor or to work. It will not come naturally. To persevere to follow after Christ, to hold fast to his doctrine, to his word, to the hope of salvation, to these things, especially in our day when morality has basically gone out the door. It, for us to say that we will live moral, upright lives according to God's word, it will take work. Amen? will take toil. It will take strife. The word here is to struggle. There is a struggle in the church today as to whether they will hold fast to the doctrines of the scriptures or will they grab on to the silly myths of the world. It's a struggle. And so the question becomes is where will you Land. He says in, if you look in verse uh, 13, he says, until I come, devote yourself. This, is, this phrase is, hold the mind. Devote, devote yourself. Make your mind stay on this one thing. How easy is it to hold your mind to one thing for an extended period of time. I mean, in the day of social media and, 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 and TV and YouTube and all the different kinds of things that, that, I mean, while we're sitting here, our phones are buzzing with emails and text messages and, and Twitter updates and Instagram posts and all of those things. How easy is it for us to hold our mind to one thing for, for a long period of time? It's hard to, unless we're fully devoted. If we are full sin, if we have fully accepted these things. I think the only way for us, the flesh, the carnal man, to be able to be devoted is through the work of the Holy Spirit in our life. Christians 
know what it feels like and know what it means to hold our mind on one thing for a long period of time. Do you know how we know that? Because the Holy Spirit has given us the mind of Christ and we have our minds fixed on what? On Christ. And all we do, we have our minds fixed on Christ. In the difficulties, in, in, in the easy times, we read last week that when Peter and, 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 and Silas were in jail, what were they focused on? On Christ. And so they sang hymns. We, as followers of Christ, the only way that we can be devoted is through the work of the Holy Spirit. And we know what it, what it is to keep our minds fixed. Later he says in verse 14, do not neglect... Do not neglect. Look at what he says in verse 14. Do not neglect the gift that you have. What does it mean to neglect? What to be careless with? When we neglect the gifts, the talents, and the callings that God has placed on us, then we are being careless with them. We do not see them as something worth giving attention to. But if we are fully accepting of these things, if we're persevering through all of these things, we will not neglect the gifts that God has given to us. And we will preach, we will give, we will administer, we will have compassion, we will do the things that God has called us to, even when it's not easy. So... Paul says, don't neglect the gifts that God has given you, Timothy. But he also says in verse 15, practice, practice. Practice these things. Immerse yourself into these things. Paul tells Timothy, these things I have shown you, lived out before you, taught you, are things that are worth doing and doing well, so practice them. And never understood Doctors, They said, yeah, my practice is down the road. Or I've been practicing medicine for 30 years. And I'm like, well, the last time I practiced something, it was to prepare for the game. And so we only practiced for a little while, and then it was game time. I never understood why doctors had to practice so much. Like every day, they're going to the practice. Well, when's game time? Paul says to Timothy... Keep practicing. Keep practicing. In other words, I had my definitions of practice wrong. Practice is keep doing what you're doing. Keep doing the things you've been taught to do. If doctors don't practice what they've been taught, they will lose it. How many tried to learn a, a foreign language in high school, college? How, how many kept it? If you practice it, you can keep it. If you don't do it, you'll lose it. So Paul says, practice these things. Immerse yourself in these things. Why would, you, why would Paul say this to Timothy? So that he could what? Persevere. So that he could keep going and not give up and not lose his sight. Next thing we see that Paul says to Timothy is to keep a close watch on yourself. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. What teaching? The teaching of the gospel, the doctrine of the, of the church, the doctrine of the scripture. Oh, this is a warning from Paul. If you lose your focus, then false teaching could creep in to the church. Keep a close watch. If we're not careful, if, we don't, if, if we're not careful, we can let little things creep into our life, creep into the church, and we will no longer feel like we need to persevere towards godliness. We will find something else to pull our mind, to pull our heart away from what God has called us to. Paul continues, and he says, persist. Persist in this. Look at verse 16. He says... Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this. For by, doing, for by doing so, you will both, you will save both yourself and your hearers. The word here in the Greek persist is to stay at. To stay at it. 
to keep going, to not give up, to persist. But why persist? Why persist? Well, Paul gives us a couple things. I'll run through them really quickly. Paul gives us a few things in this passage when he's saying these things to Timothy that I think is a reason for us to continue is one, why persist for your good and the good of others? For your godliness and the godliness of others. My first sermon that I preached at Arrowhead Church, it was at the Morristown campus. I looked out at the crowd, a crowd that I knew that I would probably not get to stand in front of too many times. But they are connected to the larger church of Arrowhead. And I knew that I wouldn't see them very often, but I knew that I needed their faith to be strong, to encourage us in our congregation so that we could continue to be faithful. And I looked at them and I said, I need your faith so that my faith can be strong. You need to persist in godliness so that those around you will see your faithfulness so that they can persist in godliness and in the disciplines of the scriptures. When we fall down, when we give up, it just gives encouragement to someone else. Well, I'm not as strong as them. There's no way in the world that I'll be able to persist now. I'm just going to give up as well. Listen, you're going to fall down, but don't give up. Amen? Don't give up. But he says, for your good, for the good of others, command and teach. He says, to command and teach others the scriptures to teach them he says also in verse 12 to set an example live in such a way that you're setting an example why do you need to set an example because there are others who are looking at you and following after you and you need to live this out for their good and their godliness but also he says to to him for the public reading of the word If we persist in this, they will hear the scriptures. Why do we persist? Why do we discipline ourselves? To keep a close watch on our life. You say, well, Lee, how in the world am I going to do these things? Well, you will not persevere without the Holy Spirit. You will not persevere without the Holy Spirit. If you do not have the Holy Spirit in your life, if you are not a believer of Jesus, and you want to, to if you're, you think you're just going to per, uh, persist in moral uh, goodness, in a good moral life, you will not persist. You will not persevere. Romans chapter 8, Paul says, You, however, who are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong in Him. And those who are in Him, He will help, uh, help you on this path, this battle of persisting, of, of disciplining yourself. Philippians chapter 1 says, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will, be, will bring it to completion on the day of Jesus Christ. God has started a work in you, Christian. He will see it through. How? Through the work of the Holy Spirit. You think sometimes, well, I've gotten far, so far away that there's no way that I can come back. You know how you come back? Through the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. The other, the other thing I want us to see, the other thing I want us to see in this is that there is a role of others in your perseverance. You need others to help you persevere. Why do you think Paul is telling Timothy, you need to do these things. You need to teach the word. He didn't say just teach it to yourself. Teach the public reading. Why? Because you need others in your life. Hebrews chapter 3 says, But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. We need other Christians in our life to help us persevere. Amen? Some of them, along the way, have been our mothers. The ones that have been praying for us. 
praying for us and encouraging us. I've said it before and continue to make the point that the Christian life was never meant for you to live alone. It was meant to live in a community with other believers. This type of community in the New Testament was called the church. It's a family of faith that should be involved enough in, our, in our, each of our lives to help us to see our strengths and to see our weaknesses and that they can speak into our lives to help us persevere in the pursuit of godliness. J.I. Packer defines this, this type of relationship. and we, we call this relationship in the church, it, we call it fellowship. How many of you have ever heard the word fellowship at a church? At a church? We say, well, well, there's this little place over here we call the fellowship hall. That's where we go fellowship. No, 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 no. That's where we eat. Fellowship is the relationship that we have between brothers and sisters in Christ that we, ha- we do not have and cannot have with the outside world. Do you know why? Because they do not know what it means to persevere to godliness. And we're persevering, and we have this fellowship. And when we get together, we need to not talk about UT Vols and the weather and and, and all the other things that we talk about. God needs to be involved in the fellowship. Amen? If there's no no God in the fellowship, then it's just socialization. So when you get together with other brothers and sisters in Christ, bring up Jesus. Jesus. And talk about spiritual things. Well, Lee, I'm not supposed to talk about uh, religion and politics. Not within, within the fellowship of the body. You're supposed to talk about Jesus. You're supposed to talk about those things. J.I. Packer says this. A, a seeking, a, this fellowship is a seeking to share in what God has made known of himself to others as a mean to finding strength, refreshment, and instruction for one's own soul. Don Whitney says, without personal interactions about mutual interest, problems, and aspirations of dis- discipleship, 